Welcome to the Nanakook Lenny Lenape Tribal Nations Native Power Hour, a public humanities broadcast. I'm Linda Little Bright Star Jackson, your host, and this is the native voice of Lenape Hokan and the Nanakook Lenny Lenape Tribal Nation. I hope that you enjoy this episode. Denise Bright Dove Dunkley is a, an award-winning master artisan and educator of Nanakoke Lenny Lenape culture. A member of the Nanakoke Lenny Lenape Tribal Nation of New Jersey, she actively educates other citizens and the public on Nanakoke Lenny Lenape culture, past and present. For 25 years, Denise has educated the public about the cultural basis of her pieces at Native, cultural, related, and art celebrations, such as, but not limited to, University of Penn Museum Native Voices Exhibit 2013 to present, New Jersey City University Multicultural Keynote Speaker, Fall 2017, Opening Speaker, NASPA, National Association of Student Personnel Administrators Conference in Summer of 2018, Nanakoke Pow Wow, Philadelphia Mural Arts Climate Justice Initiative Consultant and Public Liaison from Summer 2021 to Present, Georgetown University Pow Wow, Wheaton Arts Festival and Cultural Programs, Juried, Skimitzen Green Corn Festival, Juried, Somerset County Cultural and Heritage Commission, CNH Gallery, Welcome Neighbor, Sharing Cultural Art Traditions, 350th Anniversary, Indigenous Peoples Day, Philadelphia. Denise is passionate about environmental climate change activism and MMIW, Missing Murdered Indigenous Women Awareness. As a current law student at the University of Oklahoma College of Law, Masters of Legal Studies, Indigenous Peoples Law Program, She will broaden her reach of education and awareness to assist with securing the inherent rights of all Indigenous peoples. You can reach her at email, brightdove856 at gmail.com and Instagram at denisebrightdove. Okay, Denise, um, would you be willing to tell us a little bit about your tribal affiliation? Okay, well, I'm a member of the Nanakoke and Island Ape uh, Tribal Nation here in Bristol, New Jersey. Um, been forever, I guess. <laughs> um, so located here in Cumberland County, um, we have over 3,500 members um, thriving, doing well. Um, both of my parents are tribal members, um, born and raised here, but I currently live in Odessa, Delaware. Um, right along the Apoquinimic, which is a place where we stayed for a long time in Lenape. Um, that's a little bit about me. Uh, I have four kids um, that I spent a lot of years raising. They're doing well, they're thriving, married, um, and just, you know, living life and being, you know, just embracing culture, really. Um, making sure my kids understood that culture, making sure that, um, they didn't live through the same hiccups that I did. So um, a lot of that has taken me here. Excellent. Very good. Now, what type of symbolism do you use in your work? Um, because uh, we're Eastern Woodlands, um, I try to incorporate a lot of stuff like um, floral, uh, maybe leaves, maybe, you know, all that, anything that you would find in the Eastern Woodland area, maybe rivers, waters, trees, you know, those natural, uh, not geometric designs, so to speak, but uh, more natural things, like anything you would find outside. So flowers and leaves and um, water symbols, like I said. Uh, I often go into museums and I'll look at old Lenape uh, maybe pots and, and they have some string designs and things like that. I may incorporate that as well. And what inspires you to do your creations? Um, what inspires me? Um, honestly, it's because when I was small, I didn't know a lot about what it was to be indigenous, you know, um, not compared to a lot of other communities that I see today. So um, once I was aware, um, as I said, once I had children, I was really adamant that they wouldn't go through those same questions and hiccups that I went through. So, um, yeah, um, I started, you know, I had a lot of dime, downtime as I had children and I would just start working on things, um, uh, 
and it, it, it really started to fill up a, a lot of my time. And so my husband said, one day, maybe you should show your work. Um, and he talked me into doing the Salem powwow. And I wasn't sure, you know, there's a table fee, like what if I fail? And that's what everything, right? Like what if you fail? So, but who cares? So <laughs> he was like, well, if you fail, you're at no loss because I'll, I'll put it for you, you know, I'll fund it. And, uh, and I didn't fail. So um, I just started branching out from there, just taking, you know, other steps in, in that artist world and uh, meeting challenges, meeting other artisans, um, looking at different uh, mediums, styles, things that I can incorporate into my own thoughts. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's how pretty much how I started. He, he forced me to do it, <laughs> to show my work. What are some of the different types of art that you work on? So um, these are some of my dolls, um, Cornhusk dolls. And I, I try to, um, I even try to switch them up. I'll do, um, so I'll do the Cornhusk dolls. I may do Cornhusk ornaments. Um, I work with a lot of natural materials. So I may make corn cob dolls, right? Um, basically anything that I find out there in that um, natural realm it could be just sticks it could be an interesting root that i find um that will take me to a concept or an idea maybe that's a dancing stick you know what i mean now or um uh i do a lot of gourd work um and i love the naturalness of gourds and the functionality that it had for um eastern woodlands people so it could be anything from a bowl to gourd jewelry to gourd dolls to um maybe a dipper, you know, for ceremonies or things like that. Uh, I do Delaware regalia. I do uh, ribbon work, things like that. I do um, ribbon skirts now. Um, and all of that started because now my kids need a regalia, right? So mm -hmm. then I, you know, my, my grandmother sewed and it was something that I just thought was like awful boring until I started realizing that I could create some really cool things just with patience. So I feel like, you know, with creativity and patience, you really can cross um, into a realm of really creating anything. So uh, when I frequent museums or I look at, um, you know, people, different styles of dance clothing, I just come up with my own concept, you know, being self-taught of how I could make that work. Um, I'll do moccasins. I'll do, um, I've done jingle dresses. Um, like I said, my first powwow was in 2000. So um, from there, I started adding on more powwows and art shows. And sometimes, you know, it depends on what show I'm going to, what I think might work in terms of, you know, winning an award, you know, what people don't have. So I may create something that's totally different. Um, uh, maybe I'll make something out of a bushel gourd, which is legit like this big. And, I'll have to see the shape of it first to figure out like what it might want to be, that kind of thing. Uh, what else do I make? Um, the usual like dream catchers and things like that. Um, a lot of powwow stuff. I tend not to keep a lot. Um, I'll sell it and you know, like say for example, somebody might come up to me and say, hey, like, you know, I got these earrings from you like so many years ago, but I won't remember because a lot of my stuff is like a one of a kind thing. Um, so, which is kind of cool in a way. You know what I mean? That, you know, people realize that they'll get like, you know, a really unique item that's not like mass produced. Um, what else do I make? I do rattles. So I do beaded jewelry. I'll do chokers. Um, but I tend to go up and down with cycles of things. You know what I mean? So maybe I'm really interested in painting for a time, you know, um, and I, I won't say I get bored a lot, but like my mind just takes me in different directions. So maybe at some point I'm into painting, maybe another point I'm into sewing. Um, maybe someone's commissioned me for some Delaware blouses or whatever. So I'm in that for a few months. Um, so sort of all over the place. <laughs> Somehow I get it all done, you know, um, and I average before COVID, I was averaging at least 12 big shows a year. Um, and then I was fitting some small shows in. Um, now I'm back to showing on a larger scale in, uh, in the art world, um, which I think is really important because yeah, I can show it at powwows, but I think it gets a more global, 
uh, more global recognition on those types of platforms. So. Good. Why is it important for you to display your work? So it's important for me to display my work because um, as indigenous people, we're, we've, we've struggled a long time to validate ourselves and to show that we're still here. Um, and in showing that we're still here um, and having those hard conversations with people, they usually start through my artwork. Um, and so all those shows that I go to or when people have questions, it will always circle back to who are your people? What is your community? What does this work mean? And it just, you know, a lot of conversations I had are really hard. And some of the shows I've been to, people have outright argued with me about our existence and what they've been taught. You know, historically, I've been taught that there aren't, you know, there aren't any more Lenape people or Nanako people. Um, and then naturally it will go into, well, you're wrong because, you know, I'm here and I'm showing you this, you know. Um, so in that respect, it's, um, you know, at one powwow, if it's a large powwow, I may meet 5,000 people. And so that's 5,000 conversations that I can have, you know, um, sharing my work, making people knowledgeable about what certain things mean, you know, and just picking people's brain just a little bit and planting that seed that, you know, I met this young lady. And even if I gifted you a bottle of water and you came to my booth because you were hot, it just, you know, it kind of immortalizes that concept that these people are real, they're genuine people, they still exist. And, um, you know, and even uh, intermingling with other communities that might not know that we're, we're still here. You know, um, I think that's super important because on their platforms gives us recognition as well. So if I'm, if I'm in the midst of those worlds, you know. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to share with you is, um, um, and I have to pay tribute to Rose Ridgeway, my auntie. <laughs> um, when I was about, um, I was small, maybe like nine or 10. And I would go uh, to the powwows, you know, when you're young and you haven't really, um, you see beautiful things, but you have no idea like how to make them, you know. And I remember begging my mom for, um, just a small little pair of porcupine earrings. And I remember examining them and like, wow, this looks like I have nowhere, I have no idea where this started or finished. You know what I mean? But I was just enamored with this, you know, these just pretty trinkets like any little girl would be. Um, and so we went down to the tribal office, which is in downtown Bridgeton. That's where she worked forever, you know. Um, you know, shout out to her. She made me write the, but um, so I go in and I say to her, um, you know, looking in a little gift shop in, in a glass case, something like this. And I'll just come more. There's more of the pretty jewelry. And I went to her and I begged my mom to buy a pair of earrings and she refused to sell it to me. And so a lot of people don't know that story. And I honestly, I was crushed. Like, I don't know if I'm touching you. But um, I was crushed. I was like, I don't know what did I do wrong? Why aren't I allowed to have these earrings? You know, but she refused to sell them to me. She said, no, I can't sell these to you. And uh, so I mustered up the strength <laughs> to ask her why. And she said, because you need to learn how to make them. And if you're willing, I will show you. Now, I don't know what she saw in me that day. And I, I have no idea uh, her conversations with other community uh, people. But um, I was like, no, I'm really serious. Like, I, I, I would I'd be willing to do that. And I begged my mom. I don't know if that was a seed that like she put miracle grow on or what, but I begged my mom to take me to her house and I spent a whole afternoon learning how to beat earrings. And instinctually I went home, um, I'm still practicing. She gave me a little book to follow. And I finished my first pair and I had my mom take it back and give it to her, you know, but that seed is what took me to create a lot of stuff. And, and if I were away from home or if I were in college, I always uh, was fascinated with like components and parts. And I'd go through that book and I'm like, well, if I did that, let me try to do this. You know what I mean? But it really planted a seed of growth that um, that even if you can't do it, you can it can be taught, you know. Um, and so maybe that's why I do so many genres of things, you know, and just know that, um, yeah, I'll figure it out like the other person did. Um, 
So yeah, she she really pushed me in a great direction. <laughs> she was a strong influence in she your really mm -hmm. creativity and your art. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Is there anyone else that you can think of that had some type of influence? I, I would say my mom for sure, because in my um, Cordelia Ashton, uh, Durham Ashton, uh, in our, she liked doing arts and crafts too with her girlfriends. And so a lot of my youth was spent going to different houses of tribal members that were just super, super good friends of hers. And we would go to, um, I think what's called the Strawberry Patch in Bridgeton. Right. And let me tell you, I would see little beads and little this, and I was like, huh. I would go crazy. And so seasonally, her friends would be like, you know what we should make? Because there really is not a lot to do around Bridgeton. Um, and we would spend afternoons maybe making something that's not even indigenous. But it was just skills, like the hot glue gun, the patience that I, that I talk stress a lot. Um, and just that developing that creativity. And so her friend, Barbara Lopeman, we spent a lot of afternoons with Barbara with her cheese and crackers, her great sandwiches. And we'd come out of there with a big old fluffy bunny or she'd teach me how to make um, maybe butterflies through the wall out of placemats. But it was just that creativity that kind of just, you know, really just fueled me into loving like art stores and the art world. Um, and I, I tell youth a lot. Um, and even when I was doing the youth group here years ago, I'm big on promoting um, creativity in any sense, because I feel like you can fine tune any skill, but it's harder to come up with being creative, right? So I don't care if you're like singing or uh, if you wanted to go plant flowers, you know, there's art in so many different genres. So I'm really big on that. And so, and that's really like, like I said, with my background, with my mom and going around and doing all those things and spending so many time, so many hours in, uh, in the strawberry patch, um, really like, you know, and it made me knowledgeable about components and what they can be used for, you know? Um, and I'm not afraid to, um, as an adult, I've taken all sorts of classes. I've taken Sterling Smith, you know, uh, Sterling classes, like, I don't know if it's called Sterling Smith. I don't know why I want to say that. But um, I've taken blacksmith classes with a group of men early in the morning and we're pounding like hammers, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> which got me a lot of recognition in Delaware because the newspaper came and they're like, who is this? That's a female over there. Like, what is she doing with this big hammer? And they're like, well, what are you going to do? Um, what are you trying to create? And I made a knife and the instructor was like, I can't tell anybody that's a knife, but I wanted to make a knife, mm -hmm. you know? So I made a knife and like a door hook, but I feel like any skill you learn, you can kind of fine tune it back to your, it will recycle back to your own creativity at some point, you know? Um, so if at any point I'm creating some kind of sculpture, I'll have blacksmithing skills or I know how to use that torch. You know what right, I mean? Right. Or in a hammer. So, right. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Very good. And you had a chance, you said you worked with the youth at one time. I did. I did a uh, little acorns here um, at the tribal center for six years. And that was, that was cool. And I liked watching those kids develop. One of the highlights of doing that was um, I had done some research on um, weaving string and materials. So I was like, you know, what can I, and on, honestly, like there's that patience again. So I took some sinew and had them pull it apart. And before they knew it, I had uh, some grapevine uh, sticks that I had soaked and I had made it into a hoop and I made them make their own nets, you know? Now the trick was, and I don't know if you remember that weekend, but I had people at the meeting wanting to leave the meeting and come help out with these nets because the trick was if you made a good net, a good fishing net, then you could get a goldfish. So I came in with a 20 gallon tote of water and these feeder fish. Now, if you did a good job, then you would be able to catch a fish and take it home. <laughs> <laughs> so then I had, you know, I had teenagers helping the little kids. I had elders helping. Everybody wanted a fish. And I think it was Javid, his fish lasted the longest because I was getting reports back like whose fish made it. Oh. But um, so that was really cool and inspiring that they could take, you know, natural elements create something and if you do a good job then it's functional you know mm -hmm. 
but it doesn't have to be like a cliche, you know what I mean, kind of art. You know, right. art comes in any form. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm -hmm. So do you address themes or identity in your work? And why or why not? Um, I do. Um, one of the things that I like to address is women and elders. Um, that nurturing aspect, the water, um, the earth, you know, it, that's a whole cycle of life uh, and indigeneity that we live. So uh, a lot of my work will involve women. And um, like I told you earlier, like I love the grandmothers, you know, mm -hmm. so you'll see that. You may see some MMIW stuff on missing and murdered women. I'd like to acknowledge the fact that um, as indigenous women, we're 10 times more likely to go missing and murdered, which is, uh, you know, epidemic now around actually globally. Um, and, you know, it's a sad story, but, uh, and, it's, and it's even hard. And some people think, is eh, she for real? But myself, um, I want to say on a half dozen occasions, there's been an attempted abduction, which sounds odd. You know what I mean? Because I don't go share it with a lot of people, but I'm out running a lot and I'm alone, uh, maybe on the highways or in the forest or even downtown Bristol. There have been a couple of times when I was a teenager where someone had pulled over um, and were like, get in, you know? So you just never know. And there's just a lack of attention for indigenous women. Um, and maybe they think they don't, won't get caught, but that's something that um, you'll see in my artwork to, you know, bring awareness to that. And, uh, and also women's rights and things like that. Like we need men for sure. And I don't men bash. <laughs> I have two sons, but um, without women, like where would we be? You know what I mean? Because we're, um, the caretakers and you know the, the strength givers and they set things in motion telling you why you know what I mean so if everyone's on board with the head of the household and uh when she's leading a strong household then you know hopefully everyone falls in line right. <laughs> that's how I run my household at least <laughs> right. now the dolls that I see the they're corn husk dolls could mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about them and so these corn husk dolls um uh, you know, years ago, uh, indigenous uh, children or uh, women, uh, we didn't waste anything. So um, typically when you see um, native toys or reflections on dolls, they're, uh, they're made with something natural, okay? Um, I actually started getting fascinated with dolls when I made a trip out to Bartlesville and I learned about the Lenape uh, doll dance. So that, that was really cool. And I went and saw some dolls in the museum and there were some dolls with some walnut faces, just naturally carved. Um, they really take a spirit of their own. Um, so all natural again, I would, um, it's all sinew and uh, in, in corn husk. You can take the, the, the silk uh, and if you have some and you can make the hair, um, you know, and again, it's real stiff. Um, there's a technique to um, getting it soft enough, you know, you just have to be real careful with, with water and, and be quick, but, um, you know, you can make them pliable and, uh, and you'll see underneath. So there's just different ways, like she's hollowed out on the inside and right. she has a little body like a main frame up at the top with some arms. Um, I've done some with corn cobs where the cob, the head itself is um, right. the structure. And maybe I've given a little panties underneath or something like that. Right. But, um, so that one's like that. And then you'll see the one in the back with the blanket. Um, I've, um, I've done some more functional ones where I would take um, maybe the corn cob for the, the body and just the legs would be like a cotton cloth. And then I would put more like pieces of corn cob for the feet, so it would be more functional. But historically, like our, our dolls or any type of toy like that would be out of natural materials, you know. And what I think is so cool about them is that they really take on their own energy. And so as I, as I was telling you earlier, right. if, if I make one, like I said, you have to be quick and she comes out bent over, then that's a grandma, you know, or grandpa, you know, something like that. And then I'll just pretty much just allow the energy of the item that I'm making tell me what it wants to do. 
usually if I try to force it, if I say, okay, I'm going to make this, uh, if I'm going to make a purple scooper and it's going to be this way, it never turns out right. So I always, I might have a concept, but the item usually tells me what it wants to be. <laughs> so it's just kind of cool in a way because you never know what you're going to get. And, and maybe that's uh, helps me out with the one of a kind thing exactly. that, uh, that I get because everything has different energy, right? So what else are you working on? So right now, actively, I um, uh, am working with Philadelphia Mural Arts. They have a climate justice initiative that's going on, and they brought me on as an indigenous collaborator to give uh, a perspective, an indigenous perspective of Lenape Hoking, the land of Lenape, and what we feel about this area and how we might want to support uh, what's going on with our global warming and our climate crisis. So I started working with them um, last summer, actually. Um, we are actively still looking for a wall for that mural. Um, it's a beautiful mural. I uh, pretty much did the bottom half of it and gave it its theme and started them off. And then the, um, the head muralist took off the rest of the way. Um, but a lot of feedback we're getting on that mural is that it's too hard of a topic. And I can't see how that's possible because global warming is a hard topic. And if we sugarcoat it, what would be the incentive to fix it? Right. So, uh, you know, they're worried about uh, what school children might think, and those are the ones we need to learn the most. Um, and they're worrying about um, how comfortable somebody might be with looking. Um, the mural touches on um, extraction. It touches on toxicity in the water. It touches on MMIW because um, that's a lot of the reason we have a lot of women that are murdered and missing. Not the only, but a lot of the reason because of the man camps uh, that go up around the oil refineries and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, it touches on um, plastics and just different things. Um, that have created a world that you know our people uh were fortunate enough not to have to experience you know before it was you know what i mean flush and green colonization brought a lot of toxicity and a lot of um a lot of greed and a lot of extraction so the mural is about that but it does have hopes and so at the top you'll see like you know if we do things better if we do seed sovereignty if we go more green uh, maybe electric cars you know so it has hopes at the top but still people think that it's too hard of a challenge and they're worried about the people in philadelphia that might um fund the buildings maybe there are people that own the buildings the, the owners are from texas or something um so they're having a hard time finding a building which i think is really sad and it shows uh, where we're at as a as a as a nation right now um for things like that um, so that's uh, Philadelphia Mural Arts. So if you were to look that up, Philadelphia Mural Arts Climate Justice Initiative, you'll be able to see the mural. There's a whole breakdown of, uh, it's on video and everything, so that's kind of cool. So I'm working with them on that. Um, and I'm also, I, I brought a card in. So my stuff is currently showing uh, some, I guess I maybe 12 different items are down in Baltimore right now at Creative Alliance. And so you can look it up, creativealliance.org. It's in Baltimore. Um, and it's a campaign um, and a showing that, you know, we're still present. So that's kind of cool. So down there I have some ribbon dresses, um, a big bushel gourd with a woman and a baby on it, um, some more cornhouse dolls. I have a, a skull, a cow skull, that um, my mom took to the slaughterhouse and I begged the local butcher that I wanted the head, which was a whole nother fee. <laughs> he was like, well, you can't have that. He was like, that's mine. So that's down there. Um, so I cleaned that up real good. And it's a, a, an artifact on the wall uh, with some feathers and things like that on it. Um, and I have a dance stick of my sons down there um, and different things like that. But it's really cool. Um, so I'm down there with some other artists. I'm down there with some contemporary artists that um doing like um ink and uh, watercolors and um some other um, oil paint artists and things like that um so that's really cool to be shown in that way 
um, especially after COVID, getting back out there and get my feet wet in that artist world. So right. now, is there a time limit on that exhibit or that exhibit? It started May 21st and it, it'll be going on until July 3rd. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Very good. Is? is there a favorite piece, Denise, that you've worked on? Well, yeah, it's um, so it's a big bushel gourd and it probably would hold um, maybe 20 gallons of water. Um, so imagine something like this being in, and it's this tall, right? Um, the functionality of that, you know, and, and, you know, so a lot of these gourds I grow, um, but again, I don't know what the end result is gonna be. So that's been my whole artist career. Like, you know, like, so I start with something, I don't know what's gonna be. So um, I have this gourd um, and the belly of, of it is kind of bubbled. And whereas a lot of people might say this one's flawed, it's not perfect. I always think of things as imperfectly perfect. Um, and what is it supposed to be? So as I rubbed on it, it reminded me of when I was pregnant and like the baby's back sort of bubbled out. I was like, all right, it's, this should be indicative or reflective of a womb, you know? So that's the piece that I named um, Anati, which is Lenape for a dear mother. Um, so painted on it is, um, and, I've, and I've carved this in, I would pencil sketch it on, um, and then I would wood burn it. But it's, um, it's a mother uh, cradling a baby. And around her are water symbols, um, as we know, um, Again, with Mother Earth and all life, we come in this earth with water, right? So there are different symbols. Um, there's, of course, the turtle. That's just reflective of us, you know, as uh, Anape people here in the Eastern Woodland. Right. Um, uh, and there is the sun for warmth, right? Um, and there are the Lenape symbols, those little rope symbols that I said you see on, on pottery and the, um, uh, like hashtags sort of the best way I can describe it. So they're going around it. Um, but on the opposite side, I've totally cut it out to make it in sense almost a cradle. And it's lined with rabbit fur and the rabbit fur is flowing out and inside are gifts for the mother and the baby. Those baby moccasins that I gave out of leather. Um, and there's a shell, which is representative of, of food and what we would eat here on the East Coast, right? And on the inside, there's a spiritual gifts, uh, tobacco. And, uh, and cedar, right? right. Um, so that's a really cool, um, really cool one. One that I'm really reluctant to sell. It's been with me through the years. It has uh, three first place ribbons on it and an honorable mention. Um, there's an interesting story that goes with this piece. So um, my uh, in, during my career uh, as an artist, um, I wanted to break into, uh, and it was very challenging, I wanted to break into juried art shows right um non-indigenous people um are always getting their stuff juried um here on the east coast because i had been to wheaton arts um a lot of women there you know or just, just into their art and it's always up there but i was so intimidated to start so i was like oh, you know the first couple of years at rancocas um which was in uh rancocas new jersey there's a juried uh powwow up there um, I, I wouldn't dare put my stuff in there because this powwow was packed with, um, dare I say, artisans that were flown in by the powwow director or chair. I mean, and they were considered the real artists, the ones from Southwest, the silversmiths, the, um, the ones that do the geometric paintings and um, the sand art and all those things. And there was really a feeling of if you want true indigenous art um it had to come from southwest right um so i'm up against all of them um so i you know i entered uh, i did in a couple years and a couple years in i was like i'm gonna enter something small didn't get any acknowledgement and when i made a nazi i came for it i was like all right i'm gonna push this in there with them i've been i got my feet wet now you know what i mean so i just i worked on her a long time um and I entered her in the mixed media category, 
Now, um, I'm not embarrassed or ashamed to say that I was the only person in that category. So that should have given me a win, but it didn't. Um, and again, it was more validation that the real artists or Southwestern artists, you know, that were flown in. Um, being a law student at, at OU, now I realize that a lot of that comes from your state recognition versus your federal recognition. And there's a lot of tricks to who is considered legit that funnels down from our federal government, you know, mm -hmm. and what people are taught, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so can you blame them in a sense, but then not, right? So I didn't win. And uh, I was just so upset because I was the only one in that category. And so when I questioned it, um, one of the gentlemen from the Southwest area that they had recruited to be a, a, a judge, he told me that it was folk art. And uh, being the tenacious person that I am, I was like, you know, all of this stuff folk art that's how we're all here you know what I mean and they're very really like you know coming from a low-income household um you know I didn't go to art school you know what I mean or anything like that a lot of us are self-taught so we're all doing folk art um so I challenged him and uh I challenged Rand Kokis um their powwow uh committee and there are and they're and their judges and uh when I returned I returned with a letter from the Smithsonian from, uh, from my dear friend, Gabby Tayak, who was working there as a curator at the time, um, giving them a detailed explanation of, um, of what um, my piece appeared like to her um, and what folk art was. And I also came with some other literature from other um, art uh, museums about what folk art was. Um, so that challenge gave me that ribbon, that first place ribbon. And then I took that piece to other places like Skimitson and Mohegan Sun, um, which gave me more fuel because they actually did um, honor that piece the first go around. I didn't have to challenge them. So that's a really uh, personal piece to me. It, um, when, I, when I see it, not only is it beautiful, but it shows my growth and it reminds me of the struggle that I, that I endured. To get that validation right. um, and one thing that I'd love to say about Gabby Taya is that um, she says you know I'll do this for you for sure um, that's terrible that that happened to you she said but I need you to think bigger than this and uh, so you know for me this was everything first place win I'm like yes you know what I mean All right. um, but that fueled me it took me a minute to digest what she what she meant. And I said, oh, I'm supposed to be thinking bigger than powwows. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that put me in the mindset of like, hey, you know how many hours you put in for this artwork? Do you know how many hours of, of study under somebody else that you've taken these blacksmith classes, these silversmith classes, these uh, paint classes? Um, I'm always off just learning. Um, you're moving in the realm of you know master artisan now you know um and i was like and i'm gonna go get it so you know i found myself in the delaware art museum you know i have seven pieces on display now at the university of penn museum um and whatever somebody commissions me to make you know i'll make it and now i'm down at creative alliance because i was like you know um i have to get back out there after this pandemic um and see where this goes. So my focus now is to, um, I, I wanna go on a, on a national level. Um, and I think I wanna do more, I wanna do more art shows, possibly less powwows. I want the concept of me to be like, if I'm at your power, you're lucky that I'm there. You know, right. <laughs> and I chose to be at that powwow because I'm really busy, you know, right. <laughs> and uh, so I'd like to sell some things online. I'd like to um, I'd like to have these dolls um, and maybe some things like them at the Smithsonian to bring that recognition. Right. Um, so, yeah. So that's, that's my favorite piece. It's, it's helped me out a lot along the way. <laughs> 
Now again, uh, talking about the dolls, um, the process, is it a long process in making the dolls? Um, a lot of my pieces, including the dolls, um, it may probably take a few days because I'll make things in stages as to not rush them. Um, you know, these, these dolls in the corn husk, it, they have to dry. Um, and if I were to dress them before they, they seized and told me what their position is, I probably would have the wrong outfit on it or something would go wrong, you know? Um, so it depends on how they dry and how they position as to whether they're an, even an elder or a young person, you know? Sometimes I even do them with a little bun in the back, like I wear my hair <laughs> some days. Right. Um, but yeah, it takes, everything takes, it's not like a one, two, three thing, you know? I probably could make one in an hour, but um, I would know what's wrong with it, you know? And since you um, talked to us about your struggles as being a female native artist, uh, trying to uh, start in the, you know, the world of with artistry, um, do you have any advice for any female or any new artist that's coming out to try to do the same type of thing but i would i would say um i would give them my husband's advice that he told me all those years ago um i, I don't know if you guys remember tandy leather he took me there and i made some things and all the time that i spent in europe with him um you know i just accumulated all this stuff and so when we were out a lot together shopping and you know i would look at certain things and I may make a comment that I should try to make that or maybe I will make that and and he would he would comment back that the only difference between you and that person over there that's selling that is that they're showing it and you're not so I would um, my advice would be to get out of your own way um, nothing has to be perfect it, it, everything you make is uniquely you so and no one can challenge you and say hey that's not real art or that's folk art um, or they can say, I've never seen that before, but they shouldn't have because it, it didn't exist before you made it, right? But, and so just really just get out of your own way and not be afraid to show your work because um, if you appreciate it, I guarantee you somebody else will appreciate it too. And a lot of it comes from your energy. So if you're skeptical about it, then you know what I mean? You give that off to people. So you don't want to do that. You want to be positive and uh and, and not be afraid and there are a lot of places where you know you might not have to do an art show you maybe um can submit some photos to some different things online um there are some sites called like calling all artists and things like that um you will be out there with non-indigenous people um and you know you will have to answer some you know some hard questions be ready for that and just be confident in yourself about um who you are and um if you make it with love and not put any um, consequences on it, you know, not afraid to take that step, I mean, who cares if you, I, I can't say who cares if you fail because it, it's not really failing if you're out there, you know, at least you're out there, you know, so who cares where it goes, just try, you never know. And I know you mentioned about um, law school. Would you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about going to law school and your? So, <laughs> um, so I've taken on this new adventure of mine. Um, I'm getting a master's in legal studies in Indigenous Peoples Law from the University of Oklahoma. Um, it's an online master's program. Um, it's very uh, fast track and very intensive. Um, and it's funny that. So my um, introductory statement, when I got accepted to school, I wrote about my artwork. And I wrote how, I guess the title was like, how art got me here. Not even realizing at the time that that's a real thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I kind of just go with where my energy takes me. Um, and you have to just trust that, right? So um, I, I get a call back. Um, the recruiter calls me and he was like, wow, this is really interesting, you know? And so um, in hindsight, what I didn't realize was that I was really doing it all along. So pushing my art out there into that public field, like, you know, advocating for my people, advocating for my kids, um, that they've been taught the right thing and the truth about history, you know, advocating for climate justice, advocating for MMIW, like it's all legal stuff. 
you know, and it's the art that allowed me to create the conversation. So now that I'm actually in it, I can see it (laughs) more clearly, which, you know, to me solidifies the fact that I'm supposed to be here. So um, I hope that um, going through this program, I can make more alliances that I can get out there and um, continue to show my work. Um, continue to learn those legal avenues that support all those causes that I had been doing for so long and uh, and just you know kind of solidify everything with the legal language right. that um, that would just put a stamp on you know what I mean all the things that indigenous people go through and all the struggles you know and uh, it's really working I have um, last week I was sat in on a symposium for Oklahoma Supreme Court um, and there was every aspect was in there from healthcare to, to art to copyright laws to uh, child, you know, uh, child welfare, uh, criminal jurisdiction, uh, religious ceremony. You know, all those things can really be found in my art as well. You know, and all those things I, I've advocated for for over the years. You know, just that now I have the language um, to, you know, for that for a stronger foundation, you know, right. and those alliances, you know, that I'm making out there. That's excellent. Well, we do have a few questions from some of our listeners today. So um, we are going to start with our first listener. They have a question for you. Okay. You had, you had mentioned before um, the difference between uh, maybe the perception as you're out on the art circuit of a state-recognized tribal artist versus a federally recognized tribal artist. Um, and I know that that distinction is is huge, not only for uh, the tribal art world, but but other um, indigenous groups and other facets of their lives as well. Um, could you maybe speak a little bit more about what that distinction means to you and, and how it impacts uh, your work? Okay. Um, what, what I've learned in school, um, there's this whole you know, kind of like a reformative era going into like the assimilation era and the self-determination era. Um, All of these things um, have encompassed uh, what the United States government thinks of indigenous people. And it's all um, relative to uh, recognition. Um, A lot of times those tribes that are federally recognized, they've been uh, recognized uh, from the beginning because of treaties and things like that. So um, upon removal, um, the, the Delawares are, are families that were once here that were removed. Um, they went out there and there was an agreed treaty, right? So us, uh, our family, and that, you know, that stayed behind and, and that were the fruition of, um, they'd like to pretend that we don't exist. So friendly recognized tribes um, that have that contractual agreement with the states, the uh, United States government sees them as uh, the, the, the true Indians. Um, and it's not true in any sense that we describe it in a dictionary, but true in the sense of that's who we have the contract with, um, that's who our federally funded money goes to, um, and us as state recognized fall short of a lot of those privileges. Um, Having said that, if we weren't state recognized, um, it would be challenging for me to make art um, because uh, there are like uh, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, you know, that really protect indigenous arts um, and a lot of fraudulent things that go on with art. So I'm I'm privileged to have that. I can't say that it would stop me making art. Um, And I've had those conversations years ago with elders and they're like, you know, Nisi, they could charge you, you know, upwards of twenty thousand dollars if, uh, and they could take your van. They can do all these things, and and I said to my response was, you know, no disrespect, but they would have to take it, and I would have to pay that fine, and and I'm going to keep doing it because, you know, what proof that I'm not indigenous. You know what I mean? Like so, you know, so that's the that's the trickery that we deal with um, with federal recognition, state recognition. Um, and there's a lot of, um, dare I say, discrimination, um, but it's all col- the colonized mindset, you know, that puts us against, like, we never had that definition, you know what I mean? So, 
here comes the bright ideas of the federal government. You know what I mean? I'm gonna call you federally recognized and you're state recognized and you guys maybe should duke it out because you're not as important. And that's all a fallacy, you know what I mean? So I'm hoping that, um, again, with the avenue of, of what I'm doing, um, to, to create those alliances because there's strength in numbers. Um, and that's not even something that I, I used to. I used to feel intimidated, you know what I mean? But the peace that I made and a Nazi that got me out there in that world, elbow to elbow with those uh, recruited uh, Southwestern artists <laughs> gave me, um, you know, just affirmed what I was doing and, uh, you know what I mean? Gave me confidence in that. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. And we have our second listener. So you've spoken a lot about what inspires your art the history of your people, the culture, um, missing and murdered indigenous women, climate change. Uh, what do you hope that others gain from viewing your art or buying your art? Um, what do you hope to share with them through your art? Um, I hope that, um, I, I, I hope that I make um, our ancestors proud. You know, the all the grandmothers that came before me Everybody um, that struggled, that didn't have those opportunities, um, I just really hope that I'm doing honor and tribute to them. And every piece that I take acknowledges them. And um, it, it's sort of like, that makes me a little emotional. Um, it acknowledges them and, um, you know, that they weren't here in vain. I think there's a lot of confusion about our people here in Jersey because we are state recognized in that whole struggle and history of getting state recognized. Um, there's a lot they had to deal with. And I think it came with a lot of shame. It came with a long history of uh, questions. What are you? The dipping and diving of survival, right? The uh, not being able to stay because of what goes here on the East Coast, because of what goes on historically, not being able to say you were indigenous for a long time. And um, I don't blame them. To me, like, you know, I'm a product of survival. I think we all are. Um, and I celebrate them for that. Um, and the more I study about those acts I was telling you about, those that, that reformative era and the removal era, the more I study about those things, the more I see our ancestors as true heroes. So I, I hope that, you know, everybody who buys a piece of my art remembers that, you know what I mean? When they see that the sign under my doll that says Delaware, they know that we're still here, that, that I've done them justice, that, um, and even by going to school and doing this, I, I hope that um, our youth could see that, you know, we've created a great platform that, for them to, to bridge off of. You know, I'm so proud of my kids. Um, they've taken all the lessons that I've taught them and they advocate for themselves in school. They, um, they will absolutely refuse to learn something and, and they will challenge what they've been taught and they have my cell number, you know, and, and then I will end up in those schools challenging those teachers. Um, I challenge the Board of Education um, <laughs> I've pretty much done it all, and I've even made the, um, our local elementary school, I've even made the teachers uh, take uh, racial sensitivity training in the, in the summers because, you know, they were ignoring the fact that we exist and, and saying some little nasty things and not being sensitive. And so, you know, I, can, I hope I continue to do those things. I hope I continue advocating and... Um, you know, just just staying out there. And I think at the end of it all, I hope that when I'm a grandmother, you know, I hope that they'll say, nah, I hope my grandkids will say, that was my granny. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, maybe I can make up for those uh, that came before me that couldn't say who they were, you know, and uh, reinstill that, that confidence and positivity for everybody. Can, can you give us any teasers as to what you're working on now or what's coming up next uh, not for event wise but mm -hmm. what your projects your future projects 
Um, I would, uh, my future projects, I hope we get this, this wall up for Philadelphia Mirror Arts. And I hope we don't make any changes on it. You know, I'm very firm in that. Um, we had a meeting two weeks ago and they were asking me how I felt about the changes. And, uh, you know, one of the things I stressed to them, I put a lot of work in that. I, um, not just, not only did I put a lot of work in that, I went over it conceptually with my kids, even how it should start um, from the beginning to end. So, you know, it starts on the left with the moon and fresh water flowing down. Um, and it'll bring you into contact, right? And like I said, the erasure of the land and things like that. So there's a whole story to that. So to take something out, it doesn't erase, you know what I mean? Those that are in power erases the struggle of, you know, black and brown, indigenous people, um, and the trueness of how this country, you know, was. So, you know, I have to ask, like, what are we really teaching? What are we really, you know what I mean? What are we, what's our real message? So I would hate to um, take anything out because that's not where we're at in 2022, you know? And I had to push back and I said, you know, I smell privilege, you know? And right. uh, I'm unwilling to accommodate it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so I'm working on that. Um, found out some interesting facts about the federal government. Um, they were gonna put it on a, on a wall that uh, was attached to I-95 North and the outreach to the government, uh, whoever controls the, um, that highway or gives permission. And they actually pushed back and said, no, we can't do it because uh, we don't deal with uh, state recognized tribes but they're not dealing with me, right? I was just a collaborator. So where are we going with this? You know what I mean? Exactly. And so I'm like, what toes have we touched on? You know, they're not funding me. You know what I mean? So um, I don't know, I'm willing to, I'm hoping I'm uncovering some more uh, uncomfortability. You know what I mean? If that's a word, <laughs> pulling out people's comfort, I don't know. Um, you know, forcing things to happen that, that, that should happen. That was just right, you know, um, when it comes to climate justice initiative, MMIW. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, Nanakook Powwow, Millsboro. So I'm trying to, um, getting ready, you know, doing law school every week. It's, you know, I'm trying to start now slowly to have enough inventory. Um, but that probably will be the only one that I do this year. Um, and maybe I'll get into some, uh, maybe I'll do some more art exhibits. We'll see. Um, but that kind of like does itself once I get it in there. <laughs> That's kind of what I was going to, um, kind of lead into of some of the upcoming events that you have coming up. Mm -hmm. Um, so the Natacoke Lenny Lenape powwow, when is that and what, what time of the year? And so the, the Nanticoke powwow, the one that I have coming up, um, is September, second weekend in September. Um, the Nanticoke Lenape Powwow, that was the second weekend in June, it just passed. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right. And I know that you have agreed to be the featured artist. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about that yeah. before well, we Yeah, I was featured artist here uh, for the Tribal Nation, you know, I appreciate that in May of 2022. Um, yeah, so that's kind of cool. <laughs> and that location? Um, that location is 18 East Commerce Street right in Bridgeton, New Jersey. And you can check out these dolls and some other artwork by some other artisans there, um, which is, is really cool to celebrate all our uh, indigeneity and, you know, find some fun, unique things. Mm -hmm. Well, Nisi, it was such a pleasure to be able to talk to you today. And we really, really appreciate you sharing about your culture and about your artist work and the things that you're working on. Uh, I want to say Wanishi, Thank which you, you know means Thank right. you in our language. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing future uh, events and future art that you have. Mm -hmm. And uh, we wish you well. And uh, Wanishi again. Thank you, Wanishi. Thank you.
The Nanako Glenny Lenape Turtle Trading Post Tribal Store is located at 18 East Commerce Street, Bridgeton, New Jersey. Come out and see the Tribal Artist of the Month in our museum window, featuring native artifacts, regalia, jewelry, art from tribal artisans, craft supplies, music, and more. Our telephone number is 856-455-6910. We are open Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, 9 to 5. Any questions, email us at nlli.tradingpost at gmail.com. And again, you can find Denise Ashton Dunkley's Corn Husk Styles in the Tribal Store. Hope to see you there. I hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Nanakoke Lenny Lenape Native Power Hour with tribal artist Denise Ashton Dunkley. The Native Power Hour has been made possible by a grant from the National Endowments for Humanities, Sustaining Humanities Through the American Rescue Plan, in partnership with the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And catch us on our next episode with tribal artist Rebecca Fuller Patrick. Again, my name is Linda Little Bright Star Jackson, and I will see you next time on the Native Power Hour. Wanishi.